Hi everyone, welcome to Psychedelic Conversations. This is your hub for engaging in deep conversations around serotonergic hallucinogens that alter perceptions, affect cognitive processes, induce mystical and spiritual experiences. Enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Psychedelic Conversations podcast. I have another special, special guest. I know all of our guests are special. Today, I have Daniel Brett with me. Uh, welcome, Daniel. It's so amazing to finally find time to speak with you. Thank you for having me, Susan. It's a pleasure to be here. So just a quick uh, context and uh, bio of uh, Daniel. Daniel is a writer, traveler, surfer musician consciousness explorer like all of us and his search for the meaning of life eventually landed him in costa rica from the uk he's also my fellow um uh you know from the uk and we're going to talk about his book and he published a book on iboga uh, so we're going to go into that but first as always traditionally we'd like to kind of dig into your story daniel a little bit and and firstly i'd love to know about your background, your story, growing up in the UK, and how did you land it in Costa Rica right now? And of course, we'll go into your life, current your current life as well in, in Costa Rica. But let's go back to your early story. My early story. Well, uh, I was born and I'm from a place called the Wirral, which a lot of people know in England, but I live abroad now. Uh, not a lot of people do know it. When they ask me, I just say I'm from Liverpool. Uh, the Wirral is a peninsula sandwiched in between Liverpool and Wales in the northwest. And uh, that's where I was born and raised. I guess my, life, my adult story actually begins at the age of nine when we went, me and my family went on holiday to Cornwall. And my father bought me a surfboard and he pushed me into a wave. And I got hooked on surfing uh, ever since. And there's no waves in Liverpool. Um, so I couldn't do it there. So the, the moment I left school when I was about 18, 19, I hit the road. I went to Australia. Um, I learned to surf there. Um, I went back to England for three years um, to study journalism at university, became a professional writer. I worked for BBC, for surfing magazines, uh, a few others, and it, I had a fine time. Uh, I was living in Cornwall again at the time, again, for the surf. Uh, I was having a great time, but it wasn't paying too well, so eventually I got offered a job in Asia, um, where I went to, I originally went for a year. Eight years later, uh, after I'd saved some money and surrendered my soul, working in public relations for a big Korean conglomerate, I decided enough was enough. Uh, I was overweight. I was white. I wasn't surfing. So I packed the job in. I hit the road. I went to live in Indonesia for a while. Um, I met a buddy. Uh, I met a guy from uh, California over there. I went to England for a while. Then I went to California to stay with my buddy. He suggested Costa Rica. I came here for a week and that was 10 years ago. Uh, so I've now been in Costa Rica for 10 years. Um, best country on earth. As far as I'm concerned, I'm a fairly well-traveled person and I've never met, I've never come across any work that resonates with me so hard. The waves are good. The people are great. The parties are good. It's friendly. It's healthy. Um, and yeah, where I live is very rural. 
it's very remote and you can pretty much do what you want mm -hmm. which I was, yeah. is a beautiful thing mm, thank you for sharing that i was just going to say what makes it so beautiful and i think you just kind of said that why well it, 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 if, if, I, if i was to turn the camera around right now i'd show you the uh, view from my terrace which is just uh well it's the ocean in the background and between me and the ocean is just pure jungle yeah. um and you know, I wake up to the sound of the monkeys every day. Um, I wake up early, I do some work, I do some writing. Um, I go check the waves, I surf, I come back, I write some more, I have an afternoon siesta, I uh, work at my own pace, mm -hmm. live at my own pace, I do what I want to do. And in that respect, I'm very, very lucky, you know? There's mm -hmm. a, a, living away for so long, especially in a place like this. I mean, it's a sacrifice. I miss my friends. I miss my family. But uh, it's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. Mm. It I feels love. like, yeah, it feels like it always somehow comes at a cost, doesn't it? It's always something Every, we need to compromise. Everything comes at a cost. Everything comes at a cost. Uh, you know, there's, the, there's, there's bad days here. But, I mean, humans can get used to anything, I'm sure. Yeah. astronauts on the space station occasionally look down at planet Earth and go, oh, I'm getting bored up here. But uh, I guess it's all relative. Mm -hmm. um, but on balance, I'm pretty happy. Pretty happy yeah. life here. Yeah. Mm, great. So what are your thoughts about people? <laughs> like there is a flock of people like um, because of social media, because of, you know, now that everybody can find out about other countries and how people live in other countries and you know a lot of people from dense cities it's a, a dream life isn't it to be able to move to uh, Mexico or Costa Rica or even like Peru places like that um, mm -hmm. do you see that as well do you see a lot of people um, have the you know desire to move out to these places and and obviously the social media is kind of it's kind of promoting without promoting these places. Yeah. I don't know if you make sense. Do I see that desire? Of course. Um, it's definitely not for everyone. The town where I live, which I am purposely not going to mention because <laughs> publicize it too hard. Sorry about that. But it's in Guanacaste in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. um, what I've seen is four out of five people who cook one in five people who comes here just looks at the place it's dusty it's hot um the roads are awful rainy season is muddy one in five people just get here and they know know automatically it's not for them uh and it never will be four out of five people yeah. um they get here and they absolutely love it Maybe three out of five people saying, I wish I could do this for the rest of my life. And maybe 0 0.5 people actually get around to doing it, probably much, much less. Um, and I've always seen that. What I have seen in a place like this, uh, the, play, the town that I live is in a blue zone. Uh, so I, I don't know if you know what that means. There's five of them in the world. There's one in Greece. There's one in Japan, one in South America, one somewhere else. And another one is here in Guanacaste. And what that means is there's more centenarians than anywhere else on the planet. It's where people live to more than 100. And, you know, the food, the air, the water, the diet, the lifestyle, the family, the connections, um, they just combine to make for a healthy existence. Mm. And people see that. And I've seen, you, your question was, um, do I see more and more people wanting to live here or wanting to come to places like this? Um the answer has always been yes, but since this pandemic took hold, that number has just skyrocketed. Um, wow. There's more and more people just, they, they would describe it as fleeing the matrix or whichever way you want to look at it. Um, but that number mm -hmm. has dramatically increased in the past 18 months. Wow. Um, which has driven real estate prices up to some degree. It's forced the local population, uh, the housing markets, even the expats. You know, this it, it, a lot of these towns in Costa Rica were just hippie surf towns way back in the day. But it's like anywhere. It's like Byron Bay in Australia. 
Um, you know, Tulum in Mexico. First come the hippies. Make it cool. Mm-hmm. And then comes the money, and that's what's happened here. And that was always the case. But that's that that, that notion has just skyrocketed in the past 18 months. Um, and I'm seeing uh, an influx of like tech guys and you see cryptocurrency money and you know for the most part those people who are moving here are are very very cool um and there's some very interesting uh, people moving in but you know there's there's benefits and there's drawbacks the waves are more crowded that's for sure Mm. um yeah i can i can imagine sorry Mm. Yeah, just to clarify for our listeners, um, the blue zone. You said I am aware of the the spa- you know spaces on Earth, and I, also the centenarian is a word we give to people who live over hundred, right? Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. It's a thing. It's a real thing. I know there's a website. Um, I used to mentor a young young lady, and she was that was her passion to research the centenarians. That's how I got into understanding what this was. And uh, yeah, there are places on Earth that supports this level of uh, extended life mm-hmm. so uh, just to quickly come back to the um, the desire to be in Costa Rica or any familiar places uh, right now it's a really interesting statement fleeing the metric metrics now and also the pandemic has a lot to do with it isn't it I think the pandemic has been people are also it kind of like simultaneously happening there's a desire to be uh, having the laptop life, being mm-hmm. able to work anywhere. Mm-hmm. I think that's been the, the most trending thing right now in the last, I don't know how long, but I think last couple of years it's been more crazy. It is so trending that everybody wants to have the laptop life and travel and mm-hmm. locate themselves into those places like Costa Rica or those uh, Tulum or somewhere, or Bali, like some of those places, um, Asia. We know so many friends. Uh, yeah. who, who and, have uh, actually gone. And of course, since the pandemic started, the number of people who are able to do that has also skyrocketed um, mm-hmm. because everyone got locked out their offices. They were told to work from homes. They were told to work from home. Then all these companies realized that they could work from home. And before mm-hmm. you know it, everyone's working via a laptop. laptop. So, uh, yeah, it makes yeah. sense. And do you think because of the pandemic, people are now have more courage because... Uh, in the past, maybe they didn't have the courage to even check in with their CEO. Can I can I go and do my you know work yeah. off, on my laptop or something like that? I, yeah. I think I think I mean if your boss is cool with it, I couldn't answer whether it's a question of courage or whether it's just this attitude that screw this, I'm done with it, I'm out, yeah. or maybe it's just a combination of both. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> But, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And also the uh, Instagram, those beautiful pictures with the backdrop, you know, mm-hmm, people mm-hmm, surfing, yeah. people in the nature in Costa Rica or Tulum or Bali, like Asia. I think, yeah, there is this thing. Is it, There is a growing growing community and trend. I mean, there's even hashtags, I think, like yeah. laptop life or whatever. So, all right. So, yeah. Hashtag <laughs> for the matrix. Yeah, uh, interesting time. So I want to quickly come back to your the obviously the the story of your um, iboga healing and your book. So you have published a book, iboga, the root of all healing, and there it is. So let's dive into this. This (coughs) This is also a very very bold statement as we kind of checked in before we went live and mm-hmm. it is a quite a bold uh, bold statement the root of all healing so let's dive into iboga and tell us what is iboga how did you come into it how what's your relationship with iboga what is iboga iboga is um it's a plant material it comes from the root bark of the tabernanth tabernanth iboga tree uh, which grows mainly in Gabon, in Central West Africa. Um, the active one of the active alkaloids is named ibogaine, which 
is that word the the, the the name Ibogaine is probably far more well known than in Boga due to its addiction uh, suppression qualities, which we'll get to later. Um, it yeah, it grows in the jungles of Gabon and the Congo Basin. Um, and it's it's not synthesized. It's not lab based. That you do that that. that People who use it over there, they just pull it from the ground as is. They shave it off the root. They shave the bark from the root and they consume it as is. Um, and essentially, it's an extremely powerful and very uniquely capable psychedelic on many levels. Um, if you look at the history of it, as far as I know, uh, the history goes originally, its use was confined to the pygmy tribes of the Congo. And when I, when, I, when I talk about Congo, I mean the Congo Basin, not the Democratic Republic of Congo. The Congo Basin encompasses huge swathes of jungle in West Central Africa. Um, originally, usage was confined to the pygmy tribes. Now... When the Europeans, mainly the Belgians and the French, decided to absolutely decimate Africa and cut it up and carve it out and basically rape it in the 18th century, uh, they moved in and they took many of these tribes uh, basically captive and, and enslaved them to go out and get lumber and rubber and all these uh, wealth, uh, valuable natural mineral resources uh, and ship them back to, they ship them back to uh, the European warehouses to sell for a lot of money. Um, but the, 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 the tribes were being enslaved. And as a reaction, many of these people fled from the villages on the outskirts of the jungle into the jungle interior. Here, they met with the pygmy tribes who introduced them to a boga. Wow. Um, and that's how word spread to the outer reaches of Gabon and beyond. Eventually, it would go on to form the basis of a spiritual practice named Bwiti, and yeah, 150 years on, Bwiti yeah. is still alive and well, uh, particularly in Gabon, but in other countries too, in Cameroon. And they use they 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 take the iboga root bark, and they use it for part. First of all, first of all, they use it for initiation. If you want to become a member of the Bwiti tribe. You have to go through an aboga initiation, which involves eating uh, a high, high, a huge amount of aboga, and remaining flat out uh, for anything up to three days, mm -hmm. uh, experiencing visions and downloading knowledge, and going through certain ceremonial procedures. And they also use it for purposes of purposes of healing, whereby again you eat. Lots and lots of aboga, and it cures your ills. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the context. So, what's fascinating is that the iboga tree bark don't require to be brewed, prepared like the ayahuasca. You know, the the way the ayahuasca wine is brewed. Mm -hmm. So you can literally pull it out from the earth and consume it. Is yeah. that what it is? Seriously, it's just, yeah, yeah. direct, uh, yeah, yeah, experience. It's just farm to table, out of the ground, into your mouth. <clears throat> wow. So, and I'm aware of the BVT tribes, actually, and I'm glad that you mentioned. Um, there are so many courses online. I'm not sure if you're following any of those or if you're aware of those. There are now even, I think they're going to bring a master's uh, uh, degree on um, how to be a psychedelic assisted uh, clinician 
or even beyond. So, uh, yeah. and then, yeah, the, you know, I, I heard that they have now been, there are there are organizations basically where they had uh, agreements with the BVT tribes where go, they're going to take students mm -hmm. to the tribes and also have those initiations that you're talking about. Yeah. So isn't it fascinating that some of these psychedelics come from different parts of the world, like Peru with the ayahuasca and then Africa is the Iboga. So this fascinates me. How come, like the geographically, how they are presented in to the, to the humans? Mm -hmm. So do you have any idea why this is? Like, do you think I it could be... I have any idea why it is. I do not have any idea whatsoever. Yeah. What I do think is fascinating is that Iboga... Um, grows in a place where early Homo sapiens are thought to have evolved. Wow. You know, I, don't, I don't know whether humans evolved into Homo sapiens from Homo erectus in Gabon, but we certainly spent a lot of time during the early periods of our evolution right there. And the pygmy tribes, the true pygmy tribes, all they are is the humans that never left their ancestral mm. homeland. Wow. Everyone, else, everyone else, we came down from the trees, we uh, invented tools, and everyone headed north. And someday we got to the gate of Africa, some turned left and went into Western Europe, some turned right and went, in, and went into Eastern Europe and all the way to Asia. Some just headed north and ended up in England. But those guys, they never left. Mm. Um, I think it's interesting that what I consider to be the most significant psychedelic in existence, excuse my bias, um, grows where the, these people live. Yeah. yeah, yeah, amazing. So I want to quickly go back again, backtrack to the Ibogaine. So in order to use Ibogaine, do you have to, you know, what's the process of, um, is it, you said that's the part of the, it's an alkaloid part of the iboga. How do they take it? How do they retrieve it? How do they, what's the process of taking the ibogaine only? That's the, it's, it's done in a lab. Mm -hmm. um, under, I, I am not a form, uh, I'm not a chemist, so I wouldn't know the exact procedure, but essentially you just, uh, you take the raw root bark and you distill it down. There's, there's thought to be multiple psychoactive alkaloids in uh, raw tabernanth iboga root bark. But what they know about ibogaine is ibogaine is responsible for the very unique effects that the compound has been shown to have in heroin addicts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Nowadays, largely, if you are a heroin addict seeking ibogaine treatment or seeking this kind of treatment, they, they, on balance between iboga root bark and the ibogaine molecule, which comes as a white powder uh, in a capsule, um, they will give you the ibogaine because there's a lot less chance of purging an adverse physical effect. And I say adverse physical effects on Iboga, on Ibogaine and Iboga, uh, but largely on Iboga, uh, there can be vomiting, um, very occasional diarrhea, um, ataxia, which means your GPS has gone haywire and you can find it real hard to move. Mm -hmm. And I think the Ibogaine compound is given to people seeking uh, heroin addiction treatments because it largely circumvents some of the effects that might not be desirable in an anti-addiction treatment. I, th I think people looking to take this compound for anti-addictive purposes, they've already got enough to deal with. Um, and if they can minimize some of those adverse effects, they will hence the need mm -hmm. for us. But what does that mean for us in the future, only taking the ibogaine compound out of the, the full iboga tree bark? Is that kind of detrimental to the... What does that mean for us in the future? Um, okay, well, first of all, there's a tree in Africa 
called Voachanga Africana. And Ibogaine can also be acquired from this tree. There's a molecule, there's an alkaloid in that tree, which is very similar to the Ibogaine uh, alkaloid. And it can be taken into a lab and it can be synthesized into an alkaloid that's basically indistinguishable from Ibogaine. For all intents and purposes, it is Ibogaine. Um, for iboga, the, for the, you, you can't synthesize the iboga compound. Um, so, I mean, what, the, what does that mean for us in the future? Um, well, first off around, it was about a decade ago now. Um, there's a man in Gabon. He's a French expat. I believe he's a resident. I met him while I was in Gabon. His name, his name is Yang Guignon. Uh, great guy, Bwiti Initiative, Bwiti Initiate. Uh, and anyway, he, about a decade ago, released a report outlining the very real dangers that Iboga faced in the wild for a whole host of reasons. Um, and its capacity to interrupt heroin addiction, particularly in the face of this growing opioid epidemic um, was cut. Some thought it might be a blight on the plant. Now, that was 10 years ago. I believe since then, programs have been implemented to restock wild harvests as well as farming protocols uh, to promote the growth of a boga. Mm -hmm. Depending on who you ask, in Gabon, uh, the Tabernanth iboga plant is either extremely endangered or it grows everywhere. Mm. Uh, the truth is probably it's a middle ground. So what does Ibogaine, what does uh, isolating the Ibogaine molecule mean for the future of treatments? Well, um, I'm all for it because for anti-addiction purposes, um, because it means if there is a problem with sustainability of the aboga plant, then that will help to ease those problems. So as regards the as regards consuming the plant as a whole, um, if you ask certain people in Africa, especially some of the Bwiti members, they'll say that you can't get the full experience of the aboga plant without all of the molecules and without maybe even the purging, which is an idea that resonates through so many psychedelic ceremonies, uh, ayahuasca. Um, so, and some would say, some would say it's not a problem at all. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think if Ibogaine is considered a solution, some sort of solution, I don't believe Ibogaine can end the opioid crisis for a minute. The opioid crisis runs way deeper than that. But if it is to be seen as a partial solution for some individuals, then Ibogaine is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, thanks for the reinforcement of uh, reminding about the purging. Yes. In any psychedelic use or substances, you know, the purging is a big part of the process, isn't it? It's, and I know in the West, people have issues purging and they don't like purging and they want to avoid all that. But somehow it's, it is part of the work that needs to be done and induced. So, yeah. Uh, well, the, the first time I did a boga, I kind of cleansed myself for the first two to three weeks. For the two to three weeks beforehand, um, I restricted my diet. Uh, my intake of anything, coffee, alcohol, and I did not purge uh, on the first experience. And that was a very, very powerful experience for myself personally, because I believe I kept, I, I think it was to do with the fact I kept all the aboga that I took inside. And it is dose dependent. Mm. Um, and I've done everything from a micro dose to a flood dose. And obviously, the more you can keep inside, the more powerful your journey will be. Mm -hmm. sure. yeah and this leads us to your story of course so what what led you to taking a, a boga <laughs> excuse me what led me to taking a boga well um 
around about eight years ago, I became friends with a guy in Costa Rica who's still a very good friend of mine today. Uh, and he told me about uh, this sacred psychedelic route that came from Africa, which I had heard of before, um, but only briefly in passing and things that I read. The more I looked into it, the more I thought to myself, that sounds wild. Um, obviously, I had some things to work out on a personal and emotional level, but I, I, and I did go in with a very uh, humble, respectful attitude, but I wasn't seeking on a, personally to uh, quit any addictions. Um, and I didn't have too much knowledge of it, and uh, but I did go in with humility. I didn't go in with an attitude of, right, show me. And I've since found out that if you do go in with an attitude of, right, show me what you've got, then you might get, you, you might get humbled, but that's another story. Um, and so the day came, and I went up to his spa in the mountains of Gu Guanacaste, and there were beds laid out and water jugs, and we had a sitter. And I took a preliminary dose of a boga. We took root bark, took maybe four grams. Um, I started to feel that, and then I took another 14 grams. Wow. That's when it hit me very, very, very hard. And I was like, okay, I need to lie down right now. And... I lay down and I was looking up at the top of the rancho and it's a big wooden structure. And I saw a big orange firefly. And I remember thinking to myself, that's odd because there's no orange fireflies in Costa Rica. And I stirred at it for a minute. And then this firefly burst open into a billion other fireflies and they all came raining down on me. And I was like, okay, here we go. And that's when the vision started. And I put my eye mask on and 12 hours later, I took my eye mask off mm -hmm. and went, wow, what the hell was that? Yeah. Wow. So the wow. process in the process, you know, you know, some of the psychedelic medicine processes are quite somatic where people shake, roll around, cry, mm -hmm. do all kinds of things. Did you have like a inward experience where you were, completely uh you know steady uh, eye shades <clears throat> like nobody could tell you were in a process um no i lay there i lay there i was i was still and i was i went to the bathroom a few times but for the most part i was still and i was silent uh so nobody you you, you couldn't see the physical torturing mm -hmm. that was going on inside me which is really really interesting um, I thought I'd cleansed, I thought I'd purged, um, but Iboga was like, no. And I could feel it's like a crew of a million molecular nanotechnicians going into your body and just going, right, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, pulling this out, pulling, get rid of that, this goes here, that goes there. Um, I was a smoker at the time and I, I felt it, I felt it just go to work on my lungs um, and cleaning my lungs felt insanely better the next day. Um, and it's basically, it, it, to, to, to that end, it felt like surgery, and it was absolutely brutal. It was awful. But your mind is on a different plane entirely. Mm -hmm. Literally, in some ways, you've detached, you've left your body, and you're almost you're all, you're almost playing the role of observer to yourself and looking at yourself and looking at these nanotechnicians go to work and saying, "Oh wow, that's interesting. I didn't know that was I didn't know that was wrong with me. I didn't know that's how you did that. Okay, oh well, that's good. Okay, oh, wow, this hurts. Oh wow, look, there's angels flying past. Mm -hmm. uh, so on a physical level, it was brutal. I got pounded. But on a mental, spiritual, if you want to call it, level, uh, I was tuned to a different frequency entirely. And yeah. it, it's like there's two voices and one saying, well, you can concentrate on the fact that you're getting a living hell beaten out of you right now, or we can show you the meaning of existence. Which would you prefer? And I'll take the latter. 
thanks. Um, and yeah, I went through this crazy, crazy visual experience, one aspect of which utterly confounded and bewildered me so much so that was the the, the, the basis of the book was um it was founded in this particular experience but i went through uh all manner of visions and eventually i felt i felt i was traveling with uh some form of intelligence and eventually we got to a point where this entity said to me okay we're done We've shown you all we can show you. And I said, okay, cool. Thank you. We're still here. And he said, it said, yes, we're still here. What would you like to do? Um, and I said, I don't know. He said, would you like to go surfing? I was like, no. <laughs> and offered me this menu and list of things. And I was like, eh, not really. And in the end, it said, would you like to go to a party? And I said, yes. And we went to a party and that's... Uh, that's why things got really wild. I got into, uh, anyway, anyway, <laughs> that's, in, that's literally another story. But mm -hmm. um, I returned from that journey and my mind was utterly blown, utterly completely blown and stayed blown. And I guess I'm a pretty inquisitive, curious person. And I especially about this. And I read all the books that were available on the subject and there really wasn't many. Mm -hmm. And despite some good attempts, you know, I'm, I'm probably uh, a bit biased as a professional writer, um, but I read all the books and despite some good attempts, there was nothing on the market that I wanted to read. There was nothing out there that answered my questions. And so I decided to write the book that I wanted to read. Um, I thought it yeah. take I thought it would take me eighteen months. It took me six years. In that time, I had multiple Iboga journeys. Uh, I went to Africa. I studied. I interviewed people. Um, yeah, and here we are. Wow. It became your life's project, that experience. It, it, it consumed my life for a while. Mm. Yeah. And, mm. it, you know, they talk about psychedelics, uh, life-changing experiences, and it, it, it really was on a literal level, a literal, literal level, because I spent so long producing a book about it. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have another friend that we mentioned. Uh, he's also an author and he works with psilocybin. Uh, we did mention that somehow psychedelics kind of recruit us. Uh, anybody you. who, yeah, anybody <laughs> who crosses paths with them, they get recruited. And then yeah. there is this urge or the calling to create something along your experience or at least going deeper into the research. It's like the final message. Yeah, we woke you up. You're welcome. Now go and wake other people up. <laughs> mm. Um, mm. And, and, you know, I know exactly what you're talking about. That said, in the aboga field, that concept is squad. Um, maybe 50% of the people that I know who have taken it have gone on to become writers, or podcast hosts, or healers, or Ibogaine administrators. And yeah, that that calling that you talk of when it comes to a boga, I don't know if there's a psychedelic as strong as that in terms of it saying, yeah, we woke you up, welcome. Now you go and wake others up, do the work. And yeah, in some ways, you have a calling. You feel a calling, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, I guess, you know, it, it, for the for the plant, it's a target-rich environment because often people go into these kind of experiences to find meaning, anyway, and that's what that's what they find. Yeah, yeah. Somehow, after the experience, they find that this is the most meaningful thing they could ever invest their time in. Mm -hmm. That's probably why they become healers, facilitators, authors. You know. Yeah. researchers, podcast hosts. Yeah. 
and retreat like retreat facilitators like um you know one of the most popular retreats rhythmia for example the founder also had his first en en encounter with the iboka i believe that's just up the road from me mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so um, yeah so i think yeah there is uh, i mean i also read in articles that the um psychedelic medicines have their own agenda that's the that's where the recruiting thing comes but you know what really fascinates me daniel is that with the iboga um it's the inward journey that you take um because a lot of the medicines you know i i speak to many people who have taken psilocybin ayahuasca mescaline you know all the other kinds of um, psychedelics even lsd and other and and pretty much the experience is quite external outward uh, somatic quite um you know visible like very visible that you can tell the person is going through it and maybe it's the power of iboka where it kind of paralyzes you and like you said you can't move your limbs i heard stories that people were paralyzed for two days 48 hours we can't they can't move they need to be helped to even uh go to bathroom lie down yeah. get up not a party compound it's yeah. you know it's it's not something you can take and trip out around the fire with your friends. I mean, I'm sure you could, and I'm sure people have. I know people who take smaller doses. Uh, yeah. But, mm -hmm. yeah, for the most part, Iboga keeps you glued to the floor. Mm. Paralyzed. Well, not mm -hmm. paralyzed, but anesthetized. If you need to get up, if you need to go to the bathroom, you'd be, you'd be, you'd be advised to have some help uh, yeah. around you. Mm -hmm. And I guess in terms of the inner experience, <clears throat> again, there's so many things about these experiences that are so hard to articulate because they are so powerful and they are so ridiculously far outside the domain of anything we can understand. Mm -hmm. But what I found about Iboga and the difference between Iboga and other psychedelics in relation to the internal journey. If you are going in search of spiritual exploration or inner discovery or healing, blah, 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 then with other psychedelics, from my experience and from the experiences I've heard from other people, it can take a while to have those questions answered if those questions are answered at all and the answers may come in some garbled swirling unintelligible form you know if you're lucky they might come right away um but often the answers that you search for it's like the are delivered by some kind of in some kind of cryptic code it's like we have given you the tools now you go and figure it out and in boga for the most part or for me personally and for other people i've spoken to it's not like that. Um, and they say on Iboga, you should prepare questions before you go in. And that's what I did on multiple occasions, on multiple journeys. I prepared questions before mm -hmm. I went in. And the questions can range from, I don't know, why do I continue to sabotage myself or what makes me lazy? The basics mm -hmm. up to you what's what what is the universe what is the purpose of life and what is my role within it and what's interesting on iboga that i found and many others have found is that the answers don't come in these swirling unintelligible ways they come instantaneously the agency that is delivering those answers you want to call it angels you want to call it entities you want to call it your soul you want to call it your psyche whatever but at the entity that is delivering those answers you know it, it's the answers to some of the biggest questions you can ask and they feel very very true but when they're delivered it, it's not there's not pomp and circumstance and choirs of angels with trumpets it's just it, 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 they just hold up a mirror and go bang what this is child's play what next mm. and those answers can come you know you can download or feels like terabytes of information in milliseconds. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, in terms of that inner journey, for the most part, and not for everyone, um, but for the most part, 
you may you may return from that journey with more information than you know know what to do with. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah, and one one of my theories is Daniel that a lot of people who seek psychedelic experiences, and because of the ineffable experience, um, unless the person is unless the person has some kind of a capacity, maturity, humility, respect for the medicine, mm -hmm. and also somehow they develop themselves in a way, it's almost like. Um, it's almost it's almost like somebody starting to meditate the first meditation session you know how it is like oh my god i can't sit here my body is aching my back is hurting la 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 you know the, the the mind is crazy busy it feels a bit like that and somehow the psychedelic medicine has its way of working with the person i always say kind of first um again coming back to the misconceptions of the medicine you know one time magic you're done. It's never like that, isn't it? It's just like growing with the medicine. I mm -hmm. find that the psychedelic medicine path is, is a long path and there should be no expectation of um, in the next two years, you'll get to a nice level, you become more mature and you'll figure out your, it's not like that at all. And I feel like just like having your whole life unfolding in front of you and learning and progressing and growing up, I feel like we kind of, uh, this experience of life is also intertwined with the psychedelic medicines where you grow up with them. Um, that's because, you know, compared to your experience five years ago with the medicine um, and that the work that's gone in between, and then you take the medicine again uh, throughout those years and each time it's, it's different and it's more mature and uh, more in depth. And in, it just kind of grows with you, the experience. And that always comes back to me as it the experience grows with you depending on the level of capacity you have that you can contain, like you said, all of those downloads, information, the answers. And then finally to coming to a point of your life where, okay, it's the simple things. You know, I always tell the story, but I have to share with you again. My, my listeners probably heard 10 times already. There was a nun that lived in the monastery for 40 years, 40 plus years. And when she retired, she decided to return home to a simple, you know, normal life, not want to do the nun duties. And they wanted to interview her and say, wow, you know, that many years in the monastery, you must have spoke to God, the angels, you know, tell us. They really wanted to hear these ineffable experiences. And she said, um, I've learned two things, how to eat and how to sleep. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like that, right? I think the psychedelic experiences for me, it's kind of the journey somehow turns into figuring out and mastering your daily, simple, mundane life. Yeah. Really. Absolutely, it does. Um, you know, and where I live in Costa Rica, there is a huge plant medicine community. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, people do treat it with respect, and they do like as Manly P. Hall, a British philosopher, said. He said, "Once you get the once you get the message, hang up the phone." Um, but I've met plenty of people on my journey who they do it maybe once or twice, and like, "Oh wow, I found the answers. The answers are up in the astral plane or the ether." Mm -hmm. or on nine and these realms and domains that you visit on these journeys, and they keep going back. And I've, I've met people like that, and it's never ended well. It's never ended well. Um, and, yeah, it's about, it's about doing the work. It's about coming back and applying that um, into your daily life. And it's not, you know, it's, it, it, it's not easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what's, what's interesting is before you were discussing how the plant medicine works and seems to evolve, alongside you and at your own pace that may be true for certain compounds mushrooms uh, ayahuasca etc for the most part many people only get to do iboga once i've done it a few more times than that the you know they do it they do it quite a lot in sorry i want to retract that statement um the most times a party, someone I have has, has, has ever met, um, a European, 
has done it has, has been nine times. Uh, on the wow. other hand, I've met people who've done ayahuasca two or 300 times. I know that the first time I did a boga, I came away, first of all, again, it's brutal. You haven't slept all night. You're tired. Your body has been flushed out and jet washed. Um, you don't feel good. You might not sleep the second night. And, you know, the, 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 there's after effects. It's not like you come out of an ayahuasca journey feeling rejuvenated and energetic and ready to face the world, you know, and under that, through that lens, it's not something you want to do again or at least immediately. And I came out of my first experience having learned so much and being assigned so much work to do. And I said to myself, out of respect for the plant and probably out of respect for my sanity, I am not doing a boga again until I think that I've done the work. Um, and I did do a boga again. Did I complete that work? I, I tried. I tried. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's it. This is, this is what it is. And this is where it's at. And, uh, and I like the way you say that doing the work and for our listeners, I like to kind of reframe what this work is. And from my understanding, the work is in the mundane, like you said earlier, let's track back a little bit. You said um, people who seek the, you know, the etheric planes and, and looking for the meaning of life and, in other dimensions, it, it doesn't really end well. It's true. And I see that as an escapism also. Would you would you agree that um, a lot of the people somehow, they just want to escape this reality of being in a physical body and having to do the simple things and the mundane things, which are kind of boring, if you look at it. Yeah. Yeah. And they just want to continually be on the high states of mind, you know, consciousness or and uh, yeah, the real work is boring, would you say? The real work is really getting your things together in, in your life. And it, uh, it is, yeah, um, you know, it's, it's like the, 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 the old Buddhist mantra, which is before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to, th these plants don't seem to be telling you that you've just got to get up and go about your day and go about your life. It's about, they're trying to tell you why you should do it. Um, I, I remember many years ago, I can't remember, I, I can't remember who wrote it, but it was a piece in a British newspaper about a heroin addict who'd sought a boga for heroin treatment. And this was way before Jordan Peterson, the psychologist, came along and the maxim tidy your room became famous that was used um in an article i could probably find it you just need to google tidy your room with boga uh and that was in this article the guy spoke about the uh overriding message that he came away from the ex the boga experience is like how do i get my life together what do i do why do i begin and this thing just said tidy your room and it's yeah it's literally about the work and mm. it's simple re it's, re also remembering yeah. that life is meant to be lived uh and even loved uh you know uh, i have a my i've had, I've had ex i have whenever i do mushrooms like usually and i don't do them too often but when i do a heavy dose of mushrooms uh and i laugh about this with my friends because the end the the climax of the experience for me is I'm get I, it's like I feel like this microscopic bug on a microscopic rock in if infinite space and all I get all I take from that experience is like how comic it is and how funny it is and how futile it is and that what that's what mushrooms not other compounds but mushrooms do to me they reveal to me uh, how futile life is but also how important it is and you know and that the only thing that binds us is love and laughter and in some ways they're the only real things yeah worth mm -hmm. living and working for and you know what doing podcasts is great spreading the word is great uh writing books is great if that's your meaning if that's your purpose then fantastic but at the end of the day the only things 
really worth living for. I just love and laughter. And that's what mushrooms remind me of. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, in terms of the work, I guess it, I guess it depends where you are. If, you, if, you, you, if you're in a job you hate, uh, then it can be difficult to go back. But hopefully these plants experiences can find a framework for you to muster up further muster of motivation just based in a I don't know a holistic sense of purpose um, and you know it seems that for the large part what these plants do is provide a sense of meaning which is very it's a it's a very difficult thing to nail down because meaning means so many different things to so many different people um, but we live in a world where materialism is the guiding philosophy, uh, money is the guiding principle, and it's a culture that leaves millions out in the cold. And meaning these days for so many people, meaning is it's off the menu. It's gone. And that's essentially why I think that these that psychedelics are coming of age right now. I think that's why they're being welcomed back into the mainstream. Um, and I think it will just continue. I love that. Continue. That's a great message. That's a great message. Thank you. It's almost like remembering as the indigenous cultures, like you said, the Iboga was initially used for initiation. Yes. I think in order to find meaning, sometimes initiation is required. Mm -hmm. And maybe in the future, hopefully, we can maybe see these medicines coming in, initiating us into meaning. And these medicines are an initiation, Uh, you know, and think, you know, our, 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 our rites of passage these days, our tribal ceremonies have been reduced to what? Baptisms, weddings, employee of the month, awards and the, in the western culture we don't we don't transition we don't celebrate the transition into if you want to call it adulthood we just say right those don't you I mean our, our rite of passage my rite of passage was right it's your 18th birthday how's your social social security number how's your job get out do some work and i was like what is this being an adult it doesn't teach you about responsibility uh it doesn't teach you about how to make your way in the world with some court, some kind of ethical protocol that you can integrate into your work, whatever that may be. Um, and consequently, millions and millions and millions of people are just lost. Um, yeah. They're lost. They're afraid, they're scared, they don't know why, they can't articulate it, they can blame this, they can blame that, they can blame the government, they can blame the elites. Uh, But for the large part, I don't believe it. I think it's something very, very hard to articulate, but when push comes to shove, it's just for many people, not for everyone, but for many people, it's just a general lack of purpose. It's a lack of meaning. The, The personal compass is skewed. And, you know, maybe they don't have the time or the money or even the capacity for therapy or for some personal life coach charging $150 an hour to take them aside and talk to them and say, this is what you need to do and blah, blah, blah. You know, Uh, psychedelics can do that. Psychedelics can take you deep, deep inside. Um... And that's your rites of passage. That's your hero's journey into the darkness, stir into the abyss, take a look at your shit, reorganize yourself on a spiritual, emotional, and cognitive level, and come out the come out the other side of it with a brand new map and a brand new set of tools yeah. to be able to navigate the road ahead. You know, and you still have to journey on that road. You still have to make that step, but now you have. Uh, a unique and special toolkit and a map that will help you to guide, help to guide you if 
you are willing to take the, take the step if you are willing to do the work. I love that message because it kind of stirs us away from the recreational use, mm -hmm. uh, the way it's become so common and popular in our modern society. I like that. And um, yeah. And recreational use, not of a bug, but recreational use can be fun as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, these small doses of mushrooms when I'm, with, when I'm with friends, we get uh, pretty philosophical about yeah. this. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, mm -hmm. It's true. Uh, I think in order to uh, in order to really appreciate the recreational use of the medicine is also to simultaneously same time do your own work. There's going to be times where you need to take it for work and sometimes for joy. Uh, I mean, especially mushrooms. That's probably why it's called Santos Ninos. You probably know. Uh, I think the Mazatec tribes, they call them Santos Ninos for holy children, uh, the childlike spirit and the joyful spirit. So I guess, yeah, they have all different purposes, but I think, um, I think that needs to be balanced. It always comes back to Absolutely. this balance. Yeah. Where you do it for healing sometimes for initiation, sometimes for joy, sometimes for philosophy, sometimes, you know, um, yeah. In Africa, the the, the, the the tribes, the hunter-gatherer tribes in the Congo, they, they say it makes them better hunters. It heightens their awareness. It heightens their focus. And I've experienced that. I've microdosed the boga. And the changes that I saw were just phenomenal, uh, even in a day and even on a tiny amount. Uh, I went, you know, I, I, I said I'm a surfer earlier. And I've been surfing before on iboga, on small doses of iboga, and I'm doing moves. I'm not a very good surfer, but I love it. But I'm doing moves that would take me 10 years to learn. And it's it's the, I, I played tennis a few times when I'm microdosing iboga, and I've never played tennis like it. And it's because I think it's something to do on a neurological level. It's something to do with... I guess you liken it to the flow states, but the the lag time between thought and action and between your eye and through to your brain and to your hand or to your body just shrinks immeasurably. Um, and, you know, I've worked on very small doses of iboga. Um, and usually, you know, I guess... For a writer, I'm pretty easily distracted, unfortunately. But um, on the few occasions I've microdosed uh, in the daytime, I'll finish a paragraph, and usually it'll be like, okay, good job, Daniel. Cup of tea, cup of coffee, go outside for a walk, call your friends, check Facebook, do whatever, do what you got to do, uh, anything to distract yourself. But no, when I've microdosed, um, it's just boom onto the next task. And you can do that for hours and hours and hours at a time. And what a beautiful thing. What a valuable thing. What a gift. Um, and I, you know, that's, I just, I, I consider it an aspect of the, the, the idea that these plants can meet you wherever you are. Mm -hmm. Just, just a, just a gift from nature. And mm -hmm. Beautiful. Again, another great message. And I think microdosing is becoming like a global phenomenon right now. It's a, it's a massive movement. I think people are kind of waking up to the microdosing in the, in the sense of, especially if they have any stigma or fear around psychedelic medicines, I think microdosing can be a great way to enter into this space. Yeah. Um, for sure. Yeah. I, 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 was, I would say as a disclaimer, uh, this is, with Iboga, there's a few uh, things you have to consider um, which don't apply to microdosing with mushrooms or LSD or CBD. Um, and I would advise anyone to, who is thinking of microdosing with Iboga to do some research beforehand and remember that it doesn't mix well with other substances. That's perfect. Thank you so much for the reminder. Yes. 
that's what I mean by um, this is one of the things that I'm always reinforcing in our conversations that I think people who tend to uh, feel and sense and receive a, a lot more benefits from these medicines, whether it's microdosing or macrodosing, always comes down to the capacity of the person and where they are in their consciousness, where they are in their maturity and how they can contain um, and also respect the medicine. Because I know, like you said, even in your ceremony, you said if you go into it with the arrogance, you're sure to be humbled. It's a bit like that. And I think we need to make it really clear that, especially for beginners, it would always be great to do tons and tons of research, but also have someone to guide them, to check in with them and, and bounce back, you know, thoughts and processes because it's a process. And anyone I know who embarks on the psychedelic medicines, whether it's microdosing or macro, they have this deep desire to talk about it and share it. Mm -hmm. It's not something you can contain inside all the time. And you really need to, you know, bounce back ideas and talk yeah. about it. So, so these, are, these are great ways. If, to if, if I could give, uh, I guess, two pieces of advice on microdosing, whether it be with a boga or mushrooms, it would be A, have a task in mind before you microdose. If you think you're going to microdose and suddenly all these ideas are going to come to you from the universe and you're going to create this brilliant task out of nothing and you're going to be, if you're going to have a great productive day, you might be mistaken. Uh, in my experience, it's always good to have, if you're, if you're doing it for work or whatever, but, but let's, let's take work, for instance, if you're microdosing to be productive or creative, you need to have, your schedule figured out in advance, or at least I do. And second, particularly with psilocybin, and, and yes, with iboga, um, sometimes you can get the dosage a little wrong, and sometimes it can get a little overwhelming. And the moment it does get out there and do something physical, go for a run, go for a walk in the park, um, get outside, burn it off. And when you have calmed, that uh, nervousness or that feeling and you come back down to something that looks like base level, then go about your day and you'll have a great day. Yeah, yeah, that's a great tip. Thank you so much. So as we're coming to end of our conversation, Daniel, firstly, thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom and your journey. And my last question to you would be, what does the future look like for you now going forward? with your life's work as a writer and also in terms of Iboga, you planning to have another experience or what, what does it look like for you now? Uh, well, do, do I plan to have another Iboga experience? It's not calling to me right now, but I'm sure it may do in the future. And uh, if, that, if that opportunity presents itself, then I will consider it for sure. Right now, uh, I feel in a pretty positive space. I don't need to feel like like I should, I, I don't feel like I need to peer into these realms, maybe because the work, even after all this time, maybe because the work isn't done at the moment, I'm working on a new project. It's called, it's a website called noblesapien.com, mm. which is a blog about uh, adventures based in the hero's journey concept. One of which is a boga. Um, I'm deeply into that right now. Um, I guess I started that because the Iboga book, I mean, I'm so proud of it. It was such a great experience. And like Iboga itself, it was absolutely brutal to write. But once you come out the other side, uh, it's a really, really positive thing. Um, but I, I, I think I started writing uh, the Noble Sapien blog as a way to just emerge from that rabbit hole of anthropology and culture and neurology and the holographic universe. There's one chapter in the book, it's called The Way Back Playback, which I talk about psychedelic time travel and what it means and why it happens. And psychedelic time travel is a particularly prevalent feature of the aboga experience for many people it was for me 
Um, but that chapter almost killed me. It almost put me in a mental institution. Uh, it took about five or six months to read and research and write. And, uh, and yeah, when I finished that book, I just decided to write about life on the ground. And, you know, and th 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 this maybe harks back to what we were talking about before, about how the work is not in these planes of existence. It's not in these, you know, supernatural, spiritual, deep psyche domains. It's here and now. Uh, it's on the ground. And I actually closed the book with exactly that sentiment. I think uh, one thing I mentioned towards the end of the book is the fact that the Bwiti in Africa have come, have identified, if you remember Food of the Gods, Terence McKenna identified the psilocybe cubensis mushroom as the potential candidate for the fruit of knowledge. Uh, and I know we're going down a rabbit hole here, but bear with me. Uh, in Africa, they have identified the boga as the fruit of knowledge, um, as the tree of knowledge. Um, and given, you know, if, you, if we're going there, then given that humans did evolve in that part of the world, it's a, is it really such a leap that if this whole food of the gods concept that the human neocortex and ego and spatial lobe and temporal lobe were a product of that cognitive revolution, which is fueled by psychedelics, is it such a leap to assume that psych that, that particular psychedelic could not have been the boga? So in the book, I uh, talk about the fact that boga has been compared to the tree of knowledge, but in the Bible story, in the Genesis story, the tree of knowledge, after we turn to it, we sacrifice and abandon the tree of life. And it seems like quite the irony that if a boga is the tree of knowledge, then it's urging us to return to the tree of life, as are many um, other things. Mm, sounds really fascinating and interesting. Yeah, looking forward to reading the book, Daniel. And thank you so much for, you know, putting so much effort and time in such a book. And uh, we'll have all the links in the notes. We'll have your website and your blog and your book link in the notes uh, for our listeners who are interested to check it out. And so pretty much um, you covered, if you could just do one last thing, I know it was the last question, but just one last thing, maybe you can tell us uh, some of the points that you covered in the book uh, for our listeners if they to get, to get an idea yeah. of what you covered. Book is split into four sections. One, Iboga. Two, Ibogaine. Three, forget, remembering, forgetment. Four uh, is additional information. One uh, is Iboga, and that talks about the plants, um, the history, the culture, the history in Africa. It spreads to the West. It talks about uh, the visions, and it talks about his capacity as a psychotherapist and a lot a lot of other stuff. Uh, the second chapter talks about Ibogaine. It's called Ibogaine. The second uh, section of the book is called Ibogaine, the interrupter, the addiction interrupter. And um, I wrote this book. Well, part of the reason I wrote this book is because everything else on the market, I thought, catered to... It talked about Iboga in terms of its anti-addiction purposes for years, for, for, for thousands and thousands of years before Iboga, Iboga's capacity to interrupt heroin addiction. That was only discovered in the 70s or 80s, but for thousands of years before that, it was used in terms of ceremony. I thought it was very unfortunate that Iboga entered the West. Uh, it, it, it entered the Western conversation for the for overwhelmingly as uh, this compound which could cure heroin addiction. I thought that was very sad. Uh, it's wonderful, uh, obviously, that we have this uh, remedy that can help with heroin addiction, but for the conversation to be steered in, in only that direction, I thought it was a bit of a miscarriage of justice. Nevertheless, uh, Ibogaine is a very, very important function of this medicine. The second part of the book is devoted to Ibogaine 
um, what it does, what makes it unique. It, but uh, Ibogaine, you know, while other, other psychedelics take you on a spiritual journey, and that can truly help with addiction, Ibogaine resets the opioid receptors. And it, it, it brings heroin addicts through withdrawals absolutely painlessly. Why it does this is an absolute mystery. Um, but it does, which part, which was part of the reason for the title of the book, The Roots of All Healing. Um, the fact that it sets the opioid receptors is just, I mean, I hesitate to use the word miracle. I'm sure there's a neurological reason for it, but yeah, it's, it's absolutely crazy and fascinating. Uh, the third part of the back, the third, third part of the book uh, is entitled uh, Remembering Forgetment. And I will let the reader find out what that's about. And the fourth part of the book is additional information. We talk about sustainability. Uh, we talk about the history, the, the, the Iboga's journey from Africa to the West. We talk about contraindications, certain medicines, particularly opioids that shouldn't be used. Uh, that should not be in your bloodstream if you're going in for an Ibogaine experience. Uh, and a lot more, a lot more stuff. There's 28 chapters, all in all. Uh, that was that was a very brief snapshot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just kind of gives an idea to the listener what they are, uh, ex what to expect. Uh, wow, that's a lot of research. No wonder it's taken you such a long time. And uh, there's also, there's, the book also contains a lot of footnotes. Uh, and I write, I wrote this book in a way that I thought would satisfy both scientifically minded and esoterically minded readers. Mm -hmm. um, whether I did that, whether I succeeded, is up for the reader to decide. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but, yeah. Well, I'll be the I'll I'll be giving the feedback very soon after I finish the book. So, thank you so much for offering such a resource in these times of a lot of confusion and misconception around these medicines. My pleasure. You're very welcome. And thank you so much for your time, sparing some of your time for us here instead of maybe surfing, <laughs> as That's you do. Fun. No, I, yeah. I went surfing this morning. The winds are the winds on shore now. Oh, good to go. Amazing. So such a pleasure having you, Daniel. And I would like to welcome you back again, maybe in the future for part two. Great. Yeah. For now, all the best with your writing and your future projects and all the best with the book as well. Great. Same to you. Thank, thank you. So. Thank you. And thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode and uh, see you on the next one also don't be shy to get in touch with daniel myself if there's any questions drop them in the comments i'll see you guys on the next one bye for now thank you so much for joining us psychedelic conversations podcast is designed to educate inform and expand awareness for more information please head over to psychedelicconversations.com you can also share with your friends or leave a review so that we can reach more people you can also join us in our private facebook group to keep the conversation going this show is for information purposes only and it is not intended to provide mental health or medical advice. Thanks for listening.